Thank you, everybody, for taking some time to listen in to another Her Wild Outdoors episode. Today, I have the honor of talking to Olivia Opry. And uh, Olivia, I I was looking over some of the things that you have accomplished in your history of the outdoors. And my goodness, just from starting as an executive assistant to the Cabela's, and then all the way through, I mean, you are award winners of the C.J. El- Elroy Award and the Diana Award and and some of the things in between of what you have done for hunters showing the light of what we do as conservationists and as humanitarians. And, and I think that you have purposely said this as stewards of renewable wildlife resources. I... I'm grateful to have you on today. So thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you today, Amy. I, I appreciate being here. And yeah, you know, it's it's definitely been a journey for me when I started in the hunting industry. I actually started as a hunting or sorry, a, a guide on a ranch in Texas and then moved over to work for Cabela's. And boy, that was an honor to work for Dick and Mary Cabela. They were certainly um, an inspiration. And, and while I worked for them, um, Mary won the Diana Award and uh, Dick won the C.J. McElroy Award for Safari Club International. And so that's sort of what inspired me to to really work towards something that didn't seem achievable at mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just a matter of, you know, putting your nose to the ground and really working hard and seizing every opportunity. And and that's something that I really strived for in, in my hunting career was to, to just grasp every opportunity I could, you know, yeah. whether it was becoming a measurer for Boone and Crockett and Safari Club and Roland Ward and Pope and Young or, or just trying to do whatever I could to expand my knowledge base because I knew that having a good foundation would Mm -hmm. grant me that opportunity to speak on behalf of hunters. And that's my passion. That's what I want to do is bring a lot of light to what is so important. And really it's about at the end of the day, the wildlife conservation um, and, and making sure that the whole ecosystem approaches is something that we recognize and we convey to those who sit on the fence about hunting. Right. Well, and, and what we've talked about before is, and do it well, not just mm-hmm. spit out information that you've been fed, but actually know what you are talking about. Be educated on it. Take the time to research. Be a part of it, but not get out there and just speak about things right. that you don't know about, but actually do the work and be educated so that when you are given opportunity to speak about it, that you you do it well. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of a lot of mistakes can be made. Um, what it comes down to is standing together, whether you may not completely understand why it's important to hunt elephants or why it's important to hunt mm-hmm. Marco Polo or lions. It's still legal and a part of our whole um, brotherhood or sisterhood, if you will, mm-hmm. um, of us standing together. And if you don't feel comfortable talking on a topic or, or standing by, um, your fellow huntress or hunter, um, then don't take on that, right. that role. Yeah. Just let somebody else do it. Just say, you know, I don't feel qualified to speak on that topic, but let me explain to you why hunting is important to me. Mm-hmm. Just simply divert the conversation. So I appreciate anybody willing to take that on because it is, you know, with the social media today, it's definitely uh, something that can really challenge a person when the attacks come. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's about being bold and brave if you're if you're comfortable with it, but don't do it unless you're comfortable. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think I recently saw uh, a debate between hunters and vegans. And the conversation went on and was very respectable for, on both sides because when a question was asked, whether it was on one side or the other, the person answering would say if they did not know, do you know, I don't know as much about that as I probably should. And I will do more research on it. Why don't you tell me what you believe about it? I'd love to hear your take on it. And it's, it's more about conversation. It's more about, uh, not winning the big battle in a conversation. You and I have talked about that before that sometimes, your goal is not to win <laughs> the whole conversation. It's to create a relationship. 
That's right. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the key things that, you know, the secretary, United States Secretary of Interior brought 16 people from around the world to give them advice on international issues. And I was one of those 16. Mm-hmm. It was quite the honor. Um, but one of the things that I emphasized is we need to stretch across the table and work together with animal welfare organizations that may not see eye to eye with us on the approach, but recognize that the goal is the same. Yes, You can find ways to relate to everybody. I don't care if you're a, a Christian or atheist or Republican or a Democrat, an anti-hunter or a hunter, there are commonalities and it's mm-hmm. finding those and keeping that class and that couth and that eloquence and giving that person their chance to speak. You might learn something new. It may be a new tactic on how to handle a question or a statement, um, or it may just be something you were completely unaware of. um, Mm -hmm. And you just expand your knowledge base. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that if I, I'm the first one to say, if you ask me a question and I don't know the answer to it, I don't know. Because yeah, humility is so important. <laughs> it's so important. <laughs> I would rather say I don't know and learn something than pretend I know something and look like a complete idiot because that doesn't do our community any good. And, right. and I would just – I would rather be a scholar and a, a student of of hunting for the rest of my life than to say I'm an expert on anything. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. Leave that to the to the scientists of their field. Yes. And yeah, like you said, everybody's got their their niche that where they do have a really good grasp on things. Don't ask me about archery hunting because I've not <laughs> done it. But I, I will direct you to somebody who can give you, exactly. you know, advice on that. And exactly. so I think it's it's being willing to be humble. I think if you start screaming and yelling and, and fighting a fight that you can't really you don't really have answers to mm-hmm. and that just is counterproductive yeah. and a problem and can cause more problems in the in the long run. And, and you don't need to be an ambassador on behalf of all of us hunters that and, and not sound a hundred percent, you know, like you like you know what the topic. Yeah. Um, and so I think, like you said, it is important to let those people talk on that topic, recognize and mm-hmm. and and, sh- and be willing to share that I can't answer that question. Right. I can give you advice on who to talk to about that. Exactly. But it's not me. You're right. <laughs> I'd rather <laughs> say that in a million years than to be proven wrong by something. And yeah, I want to actually come back to that in a little bit, but I want to hear how the outdoors first came into your life, how, whether it was as a child or as a teenager, when it was and how it became such a pivotal part, how that passion grew. So I didn't come from a family that hunted. Mm -hmm. I had a stepdad and a neighbor boy that both sort of encouraged they could see my love for the outdoors mm-hmm. we, whether it was riding horses and and um or looking for cool rocks or whatever it was they could see that love and and they would say oh i'm gonna go hunt doves this weekend do you want to come along and you know it was my neighbor boy that said let's go get our hunting licenses mm. and so we went and followed all the laws and followed all the protocol got our hunting licenses i didn't know the difference between a rifle and a shotgun i didn't know <laughs> yeah i mean i knew nothing i don't know how i even passed but um i did and i learned as i went with great mentors like my stepfather and and um it was in bakersfield california that's where i started hunting and um, from there, it was it was more of a you know a fun pastime. I didn't recognize anything about wildlife conservation at that stage. It was just mm-hmm. more about camaraderie in the field. Mm-hmm. And I decided to go off to college in Wyoming, where I continued to do hunting of geese and ducks and attempt to hunt deer with the wind at my back and the sun in my <laughs> face and everything wrong in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> And then my dad, who I, I got him into hunting and he and I would, would try our luck and, and ultimately he recognized, and I, I commend my father for this because he does recognize when he's not an expert at something, he's going to find somebody that can help him. And so we hired a couple guides to help us on, you know, a deer hunt in California and that helped. Mm-hmm. Um, while I was in Wyoming at college, he said, called me up and said, Hey, what do you think about hunting? Cape Buffalo and Leopard and Plains game in Zimbabwe. It's like, Whoa. I'm in yes. 100%. I am in because I, I love adventure and I love traveling the world. And mm-hmm. I had had a chance to do a little bit of international travel for just tourism purposes. But 
it was on that safari. We were in an area that's, uh, it's called Campfire Area, Communal Area Management Program for Indigenous Resources, which ultimately incentivizes the Indigenous people to coexist with the wildlife because they mm-hmm. will have the jobs, they will have the, yes. the medical facilities, they will have the meat, they will have all these things as a result of coexisting with the wildlife as it should be wherever you are in the world with responsible um, outfitters and, and uh, you know, government officials making sure that that whole symbiotic relationship is is put in place. Right. And when I was there and, and we were giving the meat and we were recognizing that impact that hunters have, it, it changed everything for me. Mm-hmm. I all of a sudden developed this passion that everybody needs to know how important hunting is to the world. And I went back to college. I got my associates of science degree in ag business and an opportunity came to work for, uh, the triple seven ranch in Hondo, Texas. And I decided to drop out of college and pursue that. And, you know, fortunately I have parents that recognize my work ethic, my mm-hmm. passion and knew that I was going to make the right choice for me. Yeah. And so I did, I, I, stopped my education and I went on to be a hunting guide. And, and that was definitely a, a, a shock factor for me, um, simply because I was the only female guide, the only ever since wow. <laughs> they never hired another woman again, but that's, I think probably because there aren't a lot of us uh, out there, but, um, anyway, um, and then working for Dick and Mary Cabela. And mm-hmm. while I was working for Dick and Mary, a colleague of mine, Ed Beatty, said, hey, there's this pageant called Mrs. M- Mrs. Nebraska America. You should run. And I'm like, well, I am not a beauty queen. I'm the furthest <laughs> thing from a beauty queen. <laughs> Put me in heels and I'm going to embarrass everybody, especially if I'm representing a state. Um, well, I won the competition and I won it with the pro hunting stance as my platform. Mm-hmm. And I was so fortunate that, that our pageant director and the Mrs. Nebraska pageant embraced my platform and it's been incredible that journey since I won that crown and sash the audience that I had access to to speak about wildlife conservation and the important role hunters play whether it was through television radio writing articles you know I've uh, done debates on you know BBC mm-hmm. and live television in London and you know it's it all because of my desire to travel and understand hunting around the world. Mm -hmm. My um, opportunities to speak on behalf of every, you know, the, the hunting side of things as a beauty queen, if you will. And um, that has been the greatest journey of my life. And I recognize that the media, they need that wow factor. They're Mm, not going to listen to my husband about hunting. He's Elmer Fudd. They need that. (laughs) (laughs) You know know what I'm talking about, guys. I've met Tom. (laughs) That's how I met you. But yes, no, he's, he's, He's a great guy and he speaks wonderfully, Definitely. but you, your and voice he's is so bigger. so much more impactful. He's so much more intelligent. But the, the truth of the matter is media wants that sensationalism. Yes. And what better sensationalist than to be a mother of four, beauty queen, bloodthirsty murderer. Right. Um, and, and so I am willing to speak. And I feel like I have that knowledge base because of the international hunting opportunities that I have um, to, to represent. Um, but there are certain things that I I'm not comfortable talking about, and I'll I'll absolutely come forward and say that, but this journey has, it started with absolutely coming from a family that had no knowledge about hunting and getting my dad involved and taking it to another level and going overseas and really seeing the impact of that hunter and recognizing that people need to know and being willing to take that on because it's, 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 it's one thing to be a spokesperson, but it's another thing to have attacks on your life. I mean, I've been attacked since I was Mrs. Nebraska, you know, when before email and social media, well, actually email was there, but social media had not taken off at that stage. You know, I was getting letters and email threats and now through social media, you know, it's been, well, what was I? 2003, Mrs. Nebraska. So it's been nearly 20 years. Oh my gosh. I'm getting old. (laughs) No, Um. you're not. (laughs) But that's, it's true though. It's, it's the sensationalism that they want also feeds the beast against. And so when you take on that role, it is being aware that you're setting yourself up for that and kind of prepping yourself mentally and emotionally and physically for what can come. 
Right. It's uh, nearly impossible to find my home address, especially since the Animal Liberation Front, um, who's one of the top 10 uh, domestic terrorism worst by FBI standards. Um, they posted my old home address oh, with a $50,000 bounty. And, um, you know, at that, at that time, I mean, as I've gone, I've learned so many things about what to do, what not to do to protect mm-hmm. myself. Yeah. And, and when you decide to take on that, that position of being an ambassador and taking on the anti-hunters and the animal welfare organizations and bringing light to this extremely controversial topic, um, you have to recognize, you know, get yourself off the grid, making sure that, you know, before you start taking that post podium that you're going to be protected because there will be threats. And that's one of the things when I'm asked by the press to do an interview, I simply tell them, I'm happy to do this interview, but I want to review and approve anything that goes to press if Mm -hmm. it's not live before it happens, because I am putting my life on the line. It's not a maybe, it is a certainty. I don't care how you spin it. You might make me look out to be the best wildlife conservationist there is. That somebody will still still attack you. Yes. Yep, exactly. And so it's just recognizing those tricks. And I've had various ladies from that have taken on that role and started to speak on behalf of hunters, reach out to me and I give them the tips and advice. And I I welcome the, that sisterhood, if you will, yeah. um, or, you know, and if it's, if it's men, which doesn't seem to be, like I said, that they want that wow factor with the media does. And so anybody that ever has something that they're about to take on, I'm willing to give tips advice because I have learned the hard way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've learned everything not to do. <laughs> it is, you know, having gone through having a daughter and having a son, but realizing you know, putting their faces out there, making sure that there aren't recognizable landmarks, that there aren't, there are so many things that, I mean, I have prepared in doing that I probably yeah. still need to go through and make sure that there are safeguards too. It, it's, it's like oh, yeah. you said, I, out of all the women that I have talked to, women and men, but out of out of all of us as hunters, women have received more backlash than men in a way that it is attacking not just you as a hunter, but you as a mother, you as a woman, you as, because evidently we can't be hunters. We can't be cold-hearted killers. We are supposed to be nurturers. We're supposed to be kind and soft, and and that's just not how we're supposed to be. And so it's an easier attack, but it can feel so, so personal when it hits you, and you've got to have that thick skin if you're going to put yourself out there. A hundred percent. That's, you know, the thing is with, it's not just you you're putting on the line, like mm-hmm. you said, with your children on any of my public pages, you won't see pictures of my children, but, um, for the most part, um, but really you are putting yourself out there and you, and you must recognize that before you go ahead with any sort of interviews, recognizing that. But again, it is women are supposed to be the mothers, the nurturers, the teachers, and supposed to be soft and kind hearted. And, and all of a sudden we're these bloodthirsty murderers. Mm -hmm. And when we speak with eloquence and knowledge, Um, we are the greatest threat to the antis because we are so, we have so much more impact with everybody because of how we approach things, because of how women can come across. We have, Mm -hmm. we are tender, Mm -hmm. you know, it's as, as hunters, we all, all hunters should be, you know, we, we, we treasure wildlife. Mm-hmm. We don't just go out there and just murder things and no, kick the bees. Right. That's what a responsible ethical hunter looks like is they, they take care of how well they place the bullet and the selecting the right um, ammunition and mastering that because we want to reduce the, that. We want to make sure our game meat is in perfect condition. We are, we are extremely ethical people and it's uh, hard for the antis to have us as orators on behalf of hunting because they know our voice is so much more impactful. It's true. Tom had said that when I met him at the Poma conference and he was talking about you raving about you. And first of all, that was, that stood out to me when you hear a man rave about his wife, not just in a way of 
physicality and all of that, but in a way of a passion for the outdoors, in a way of passion for other women. And he was talking and you and I talked afterwards about it, that our voices, it's almost like we're a double-edged sword. We have access to conversations that men don't have. We have the ability to go in and sit down and have a conversation that might not be heard by a man speaking into it. And so the role of women is so valuable in our community that, you know, people complain right now, well, why did she get the recognition over him? Or why did she get pushed ahead instead of him? He's been hunting longer. Well, People are noticing that women's voices are being heard among not just the non-hunters that we're trying to bring on as supportive, but the anti-hunters. It's the ability to go in and create this relationship with a small, just a small token of commonality. One right. small token of commonality. We all, we both, like both of us, if I am sitting across from an anti hunter, we both love wildlife. Right. Let's discuss that. Let's not discuss yes. any of the rest of it. Let's just have one conversation that might be only 10 minutes long, but let's have one conversation oh. where we discuss the things that we have in common. Everything Mm -hmm. else can come after that, but I want to build trust and rapport and relationship with people, not just beat them over the head with, you are wrong, you are wrong, you are wrong. Right. That's exactly the way to to handle it. And I think, I love the way that you said that we are a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, the thing is, the truth of the matter is, is like I said, there are so many men more qualified, if you will, in many instances to speak on behalf of these things. However, when a man walks in the room, hackles go up. Yes. Where when a woman comes in the room, there's that inquisitive, wow, she hunt, you Mm -hmm. hunt? And And they want to know about it. Yes. They want to understand why do Mm -hmm. you hunt? I don't. And what's incredible to me is if I can have your ear for, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes, I have a 100% success rate in helping people recognize that role of hunters as wildlife conservationists Mm -hmm. and playing important roles in in the humanitarian efforts around the world. Um, And they don't necessarily come come out with, I'm going to be a hunter. They come out with, I had no idea. Right. I had no idea. And that's so important to recognize Mm -hmm. that gift that we are just given simply because we are women. We are women. And that's, I think that it can seem within our own community, it can seem as there's some, I don't even want to use the word jealousy. There's, there's some your hackles come up or their hackles come up just a little bit when we talk about this, but it's not in a way that we are better than it's, it's in a way of use us as a tool, use mm-hmm. our voices as a tool for our community. If you're not using something that works, then you're taking steps back versus pushing forward. If only right. one foot can get through the door and that foot is female, then don't say No, just because she's a woman or she has less experience or make sure she's knowledgeable, educated, can speak with eloquence, like you said, can speak with kindness and an open mind to be able to take those conversations and listen and use it. Use it for our benefit. Don't don't not use it just because of a chromosome. Use it because – we don't necessarily need, I mean, we need hunters in our, in our world, but we're not talking to anti-hunters to turn them into hunters. We're just talking to them to turn them into supporters. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's really what it comes down to mm-hmm. is ignorance. Look, if, uh, like I said, I came from a family that didn't hunt. And if I was never introduced, I would probably be an anti-hunter because mm-hmm. how could you possibly justify murdering, murdering. El- Yes. murdering a lion yeah. how could you justify that but then if you listen to actually what it is mm-hmm. to coexist with these animals mm-hmm. and why it's important to have a balance in an ecosystem then all of a sudden there are, 
there's definitely something that I've learned uh, through this journey. And that is there are always two sides to every story. Don't just jump to conclusions because you can't imagine Mm -hmm. there is another side, but listen to the other side and then develop your opinion. Yeah. You had brought up in our conversation before you brought up the fact that if you are looking at Africa, if you are looking at certain countries in Africa and you are taking away hunting that species, take an elephant. This is controversial. It is always controversial taking the life of an elephant. But there is value to that elephant. If you take away the value of that elephant, then what you have is the people who live there, the residents, the 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 people that have to deal with elephants coming through gardens, through their food, through their crops, through their villages, and they are a nuisance. They become a nuisance. And if there's no value to them, then they are exterminated. Absolutely. I mean, think about our pioneers when they came west. Mm-hmm. They eliminated the wolf because they were eating their livestock right. or their yeah, cattle or sheep. It's just, it, I understand it. I don't have to, I don't have to, I could, the problem is, is Westerners want to dictate how Africans should live with these beasts. Exactly. And who are we to tell them? I mean, look at the Maasai warrior who all his income is, all that he has is his livestock. Right. And if there's a lion that's causing problems, he's going to poison a carcass mm-hmm. and he's going to kill every predator that came in contact with it. But if you tell him that that, that lion is worth $80,000, he's going to find a way to coexist with that beast. He's going to build taller bomas to protect his livestock in the night. He's going to do whatever he can to protect it. Mm-hmm. And it's like my, my, my friend, Miles uh, Fadina says, it's like the rat in your house. If you've got a rat in your house, what do you want to do? You want to trap it and kill it. Mm -hmm. But if I tell you that rat's worth $80,000, you're going to do whatever you can to enhance their pop, their populations. And it's really just giving a value to something that they loathe. They don't want to live with. Um, Otherwise it's going to get poached and it's going to get eliminated Mm -hmm. from, from the whole scene. And that is the destruction of wildlife. Mm -hmm. If there is no value to it and really is, It's so cliche to say because everybody says it, but if it pays, it stays is really the truth. It really is. Mm -mm, It really is. And value to anything creates a situation where you can push anti-poaching things that you're you're able to implement. You're able to pay people. You are able to – it's not just providing meat to the community. It's providing jobs. It's providing – so much more than just going over and shooting an animal. And that's right. How many states now? Is it two states now that they have made it against the law to bring back a lawfully taken African animal? It's, it's so destructive. Oh my gosh. It's basically saying that that animal, they want to be eliminated. And, mm-hmm. and it's, it's uh, what's happened in our world is so many people have grown up with this um, anthropomorphous in their life, you know, whether it's through Disney, you know, lions right. singing and, and elephants ears taking him flying and Dumbo and um, uh, Bambi, what you want. And so now our politicians who grew up this way and never lived in, in rural uh, communities, you know, where your farmers or ranchers are disconnected and now they're making laws based on their ignorance Mm -hmm. and it's doing a huge disservice, not just to the people that have to live with them, but the wildlife Mm -hmm. in the end. And that was, you know, Tom has done whatever he can to convey my husband that message. And he, you you know, he made this film, Killing the Shepherd, which yes. is reaching that audience through, you know, Shepherds of Wildlife Society. And um, that has granted him that chance to reach the, not talking to the hunters. He's talking to the non-hunters. Mm-hmm. And every time he goes to a film festival and presents the film, Killing the Shepherd, the questions that come afterwards, after seeing that symbiotic relationship between living the man and the beast in this area that was nearly game depleted because it was poached out because hunting had stopped years before and then finding a way to coexist with those those animals all of a sudden those people recognized the value of them and now the wildlife populations are exploding because of somebody helping them recognize that and when 
a person sees this film, they go, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. It's just giving them the chance to hear another side. Mm -hmm. Just listen to me. Just listen to this perspective. And it's not just with Africa. You know, the guys in uh, Mongolia or Kyrgyzstan or wherever in the world, if their livestock is how they make a living, they're going to go kill a Marco Polo sheep for their meat. They're not going to kill their goats or their cattle. Right. They're going to go kill a red stag. They're going to go, they're going to kill the game. They're going to poach the game mm -hmm. to feed themselves instead of using their livestock, which is value to them. Right. So if there's no value on any beast on this earth, then there's no reason to live with them. Kill them. It's true. And I, it, it goes back to the bigger problem, which is what you're talking about. You are personifying an animal, you're creating this cartoon, which I, I mean, my, my kids, friends come over and ask all the time, how can you kill Bambi's dad or Bambi's mom, like in the movie? And I said, those, those weren't hunters at the time. Those were poachers. If you think about it, at the time that Disney put it together, Bambi still has spots on Mm -hmm. the, there are they are not shooting in a correct way. They are shooting at everything. It it is not portraying a true ethical hunter. It is portraying right. someone who is doing something wrong. And so it's a constant conversation that you can even have with children who you have access to of those weren't true hunters. Those weren't people like me. Those weren't people right. who are looking out for our communities. They burned a whole forest down. What kind of person is that? It's a person who doesn't value wildlife. So yes. those are – you can take that conversation all the way down to a child and re – like take it completely into a different direction of the way that Disney portrayed that story – was not of real hunters and start that conversation there. I mean, you can even talk to adults about that because Bambi is oh, still yeah. in an adult's mind because of how traumatic it was as a child watching it. You're spot on with that. I think there's two key points when I, when I have these discussions um, is to differentiate between hunters and poachers mm -hmm. and also to remind people that when there is balance in an ecosystem, wildlife, they have babies, right? You, you hear this number that there's 30,000 lions left in Africa and the media, they think, okay, if I kill one, there's only 29,999. But if there is balance in an ecosystem, those lionesses reproduce mm -hmm. like crazy. Yes. And so it's reminding people it's, it's, I call it the duh moment. And I feel, I, I kind of feel bad when I point it out to somebody in the media that's like, so what happens when they go away? It's like, well, no, you're wrong. I mean, it's, they actually have babies, they reproduce. Right. But, but, you know, when I, I did a debate against Virginia McKenna a few years ago, she's the founder of the Born Free Foundation mm -hmm. and the queen of the antis. It was a surprise debate, of course. They wanted me to be surprised. And she, you know, she was talking about, um, Kenya and there's major problems there. There's, they've lost 80% of their wildlife and she thinks wildlife is thriving there um, because there's no hunting. And ultimately, you know, I'm trying to justify hunting and talking about the facts, um, but it's still, I am, it's, I'm still justifying killing an animal. Mm -hmm. And so I recognize with minimal time on a live production in London that I've got to, I've got to bring this back together. And so what I did is I said, what where Virginia and I aren't going to see eye to eye on most things, what we can agree upon, and I'm declaring this is that poachers are a big problem, which mm -hmm. ultimately differentiated us yes. separated hunters from poachers yes. and she had to say yes mm -hmm. she had to say yes i agree with her poachers are a problem therefore acknowledging that hunters are separate from poachers yes. so many people think that oh if you kill an elephant you're a poacher it's the same thing mm -mm. and like you said with bambi that is the wrong season that is poaching that's unethical and the person that breaks the law the person that that does something they a lot of times the media will say oh a hunter killed this elk and left the carcass no a poacher killed that elk and mm -hmm. left the carcass yes i don't care 
what time of year it is, even if it's in the right season, if they've just cut off a head and left the carcass, that's, that's a poacher. unethical mm-hmm. and that's poaching. And I stand separate from that person. I do not want to associate myself with that person. And I will fight against that person because it's exactly what we're trying to avoid. Right. There's a somebody put on the socials yesterday, just because we both hunt does not mean that I have to support you. I support those who hunt correctly and ethically and that they do the things that line up with the values that I have grown to love and hold dear. And there, there are many people out there, just like in any other genre that you bring up, whether it's the sporting world, the hunting world, the fishing world, you could even take it into politics. Like you can take it anywhere. You've got the good eggs and the bad eggs. Just mm-hmm. because we're both eggs doesn't mean that I have to support you. Right. Well, it's true b- to some degree. To some degree. But- I hate when when we we attach a title in front of hunting like archery hunter or rifle no, hunter yeah, or we can't trophy hunter. No. But along those lines, let's mm-hmm. just talk about the topic of trophy hunter for just a second yes. based on sort of what you're talking about now. There are guys that all that matters is that they kill the biggest, they kill the the most unique mm-hmm. or whatever because they're chasing an award or they're chasing something. That's and perfectly guys, fine. I'm I yeah, I will support jerks. them. Mm-hmm. They may be total jerks. They may not appreciate or respect or understand that role. And however, even though they are jerks that are giving us a bad name in many ways, it's the outfitter who is responsible for this hunt Mm -hmm. that makes sure that that money is going back into anti-poaching efforts, building water wells, making schools. And so whether we like him or not, Mm -hmm. approve of his methods or not, um, as a trophy hunter, if you will, it's the outfitter that's taking it to the next degree with his money and making sure that the right things are done with that jerk's money. Right. So, And I'm even, I would 100% support a trophy hunter as long as he's abiding by the law. That's as it. long yeah. as he's, he's a poacher. You, right. <laughs> no, exactly. And so it, it goes back to what you were saying, differentiating between poachers and hunters. If mm-hmm. you are doing things illegally, then you are not a hunter. You may call right. yourself a hunter, but I'm not going to support you because you are not legally and ethically doing things correctly. Right. It, it, there's there's a very black and white line on that with me personally. And I think with mm-hmm. a lot of hunters out there, The reason that you hunt is not one that should be divisive. The way that you hunt is not one that should be divisive. It is if you are ethically doing it or not ethically doing it, if you are abiding by the law or not abiding by the law, those are the hard black and white lines. Well, and it's it's to take it to another level, social media has given people this opportunity to share their journeys with people mm-hmm. and where you and your buddies on your social media account um, might enjoy seeing your shot placement and that animal dropping off a cliff or, you know, you sticking an arrow between the eyes of an animal. That is something you don't post. You yeah. cannot post these pictures mm-hmm. because it's painting a really bad picture. You might just intend it for your buddies to see but it can be something that's screen captured and put all over in another way that ultimately paints hunters in an unethical way so the photos that we post need to tell a story yes i mean look at this if you see a picture of me and i've got a mountain goat on my back and i am smiling you're like that girl rock she just Mm -hmm. climbed some major mountains that was a hard hunt and she ended up with success and you know my journey yes but to the non-hunter they just see this creepy girl with a dead animal on her back and a smile on her face and they know nothing of what it took for me to get there and so it's it is telling the picture telling the story of our journey showing the pictures of your struggles showing the pictures of your of your failures yes Um, yes and that the thing is is I was talking with a I did a, a documentary with a crew out of Seoul Korea and I said for every successful hunt I've had leading up to that, I probably had about a hundred unsuccessful ones because you think about every time you go out to hunt, Mm -hmm. you step on a twig, 
Okay, you blew the hunt. Right. Then the next day you go out. Oh, the wind changed. You blew the hunt. Think of how many times your hunt is blown before you actually have success. It's pretty incredible, the number. It is. We don't just go out and <laughs> shoot something and it's done. Yeah. We, we fail a lot more than we succeed. And so I think it's important to tell that journey as well instead of just the just these photos of the end result. I agree. Um, I think not just for the non-hunters or the anti-hunters, but for the hunters who are coming up behind us, who are yeah, you're seeing right. how if they're if you're only seeing the victories, if you're only seeing the end results that are deemed successful, then it should be easy. Well, no, that's not what hunting is. If it were easy like that, and every single time you went out, you had a in quote, successful hunt, that's called killing. Hunting is so much bigger than that. It's the prep that you put into your hunt even before you step out onto the ground. It's even before you step into season. It's what you're doing ahead of time. It's what you're doing for managing either private property or even putting effort into public land that you hunt. You're cleaning up trash as you're scouting. You are yes. you are making sure that things are if something needs to be reported, that it's reported, you can go down to the smallest little bitty way of making an impact and yet it still makes an impact and you're still having an investment in it. But you've got to show that. You've got to show those times that you come out of the woods and uh, or the mountains or wherever you are and you're banged up and you're exhausted and you haven't had a shower in days and yet you still had the time of your life without bringing something back with you. Right. And those are mm -hmm. the important things. Those are – that's why – photography and videography is storytelling. We mm -hmm. eat with our eyes. We talk with our eyes. We teach with our eyes. We see things and I, the things that your husband does, the things that the media does can make or break our community by mm -hmm. telling the story the wrong way. And right. so in essence, if you are on social media, if you have a public account or even if you have a private account and people follow you, you are a storyteller. That's how we pass on our history is by storytelling. Mm -hmm. If you do it badly, you're not just telling the story wrong or not getting a laugh or the praise or the accolade. You actually could – it could be detrimental to who we are. By right. one photo. And that's one of the things I've started to do was is to change how I post the the trophy photo, if you will. Mm -hmm. yeah. Back in the olden days, we all would do the grip and grins, the mm -hmm. smile and yeah. holding the rack. But there is a way to sh still showcase those horns or that animal, but do it with your hand on their face, mm -hmm. showing absolute reverence and post that instead, because it shows that you do care about that animal, that you do have respect for that animal. And it's it's just a different way to paint that picture instead of the gripping grins is no. and I'm like I said I am guilty of right. it in the I am past. too. Mm -hmm. But it's just moving away from that with, with what we put on social media right. anyway because it's going to be seen by more than what you think is going to just because people can take screen captures of your photos or save them and send them on to somebody else and mm -hmm. ultimately it can be a big problem for the entire hunting community based on how you come across. Yes, and, and I have been. I've been hurt from it because of what I've done because of the way the photos looked in the past, you know, the mm -hmm. grip and grin. Oh, she's terrible. Of course it looks bad. And so again, it's just sharing that, that journey, that telling that story mm -hmm. through our photo. If you're willing to, if you're willing to do it and it doesn't, that's not us saying you shouldn't be telling the story. In fact, we want you to tell the story, Definitely. but it's the evolution of our world. It's the evolution of the fact that, you know, those grip and grins from back in the 70s and 80s and 90s normally weren't seen on social. There wasn't social media there. It was a photograph that you would have on the wall or in a picture album 
uh, now with social media, with the ability for the whole world to see what you put on there, you have to evolve the way that you represent it. And I think that that's not taking away, it's improving. It's improving who sees it and who will step in and support it versus see what we used to do and be turned off by it and be agitated by it. And and that's what's happening. Well, uh- one of the things I, I like to reference if I'm if I'm giving a speech where I can actually show photos is uh, I'll post photos from or I'll show photos of um, the Queen of England with a dispatch tiger at mm-hmm. her feet. No smile on her face. Teddy yeah. Roosevelt with a rhinoceros laying there. No smile on his face. Mm-hmm. It's just because back then these were the beasts you feared. These were the beasts that you ate. It was so much more than that. And so, but what I find with uh, some hunters is that I'm proud of what I did. I'm not going to change how I take my photos. Mm-hmm. I understand why they say that. However, laws are being changed by these ignorant politicians. Daily. And if mm-hmm. we don't tell our story yes. and make the change 10 years ago, meaning now, to right. make the change right now, it's it's impacting everything. And I'm afraid that if we don't change, we're going to lose it all. Mm -hmm. And that is ultimately going to be the end of wildlife conservation. If the hunter isn't there, I mean, look at what the Pittman Robertson act is essentially responsible for, for everything to do with preserving our natural habitats in the United States. Um, And it's all comes from money generated from shooters, hunters, sports, all kinds of sportsmen. Um, And without those sportsmen, without, hunting, the sale of licenses, who's going to pay for it? Because I can tell you what, those hikers, we've proposed backpack taxes in the year, past, and they're like, no, absolutely not. We want access to the resource. We'll let the hunters pay for it, right. but we want access and not have to pay a dime. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Come if you on. take away hunting, then where is any of that money coming from? You're going you're going to have to think about that. You're going to have That's to it. impose taxes for camping. You're going to have to impose taxes for backpacking, for for anything stepping onto public land at all. You are going to have to impose some kind of taxation if you take the hunters away. 100% and that's, that's right. not going to be, I mean, look what we're doing for not just wildlife con- conservation, but what we're doing for the world that likes to get out there who doesn't like to hunt. Uh, we're, right. we're building a place that you're able to enjoy, that you can see the wildlife. And, and that's, you can't take it back. It takes years and decades and decades to build something that you have ruined and i don't want that to happen of course mm-hmm. and that's why folks people like you and i you know we, the, I, I consider it my my pleasure and my responsibility to be brave mm-hmm. and to take it on mm-hmm. but um we have we've got to try to save what we have left because the truth of the matter is hunters numbers are diminishing incredibly now with covid i think a lot of people recognized when there were shortages of toilet paper and and other goods um where is my meat coming from Mm -hmm. and it did help spike the sale of of hunting licenses and firearms and ammunition and, and that but we need to encourage those folks that are just exploring right this we need to get them out there and and teach them and be willing and and more than just hands-on, but also through education and Mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah. Because like you said, we do this past year and a half, there has been an influx in people getting out there and uh, angling and hunting, but they need to do it well. We need to create that generation that is coming in to be good stewards of our land. And That's more than just picking trash up. (laughs) That is so much more than that. It's supporting the politicians that do well, that do have that in in their minds and in their hearts and in their passions. It's we have a great governor right now in Tennessee. Is he perfect? No. But during COVID, he got quarantined because of exposure. And what did he do? He went bow hunting. 
He was on That's his own awesome. property. He was able to go bow hunting. He posted pictures of it. That's what he was doing. He supports getting into the outdoors, whether you're a hunter or a fisherman or just someone who loves to be in the outdoors. And sadly, we have states that don't have that. And I mean, Oregon is one of those states that we are just watching it. I'm watching it from here and my heart is breaking for what I see in the next 10 years if this does go through. Oh, yeah. I mean, the thing is, you know, like the state of California, they stopped the the hunting of the mountain lion and their numbers are through the roof. And now they're mauling joggers and eating Fifi and the kitties and all Mm -hmm. that stuff. And and there is imbalance. And now instead of the taxpayers generating money from responsible, ethical, legal hunting, um, they're paying sharpshooters to handle the issue and i took on the minister of parliament in scotland over an issue with an invasive species this goat that wasn't from the island and i said to him okay you want there's this there's this animal that's not even from scotland that's an invasive species and you want to end the hunting of this goat what is your solution Mm -hmm. for their overpopulation Mm -hmm. I said, because this is not an animal from your country. And he said, well, I want to do birth control and we will hire sharpshooters where necessary. I said, so you want the Scottish people to pay for birth control of this non-indigenous species instead of generating money from a foreign hunter to take care of it for you. Right. I mean, it's like complete ignorance. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so frustrating sometimes, but it, it really is just ignorance and i embarrassed him and i you know i'm not there to shame people and embarrass people but to bring light to something that's kind of a duh moment right right (laughs) and and there there are ways to do it that um you kind of have to read the room (laughs) right read the room see how do you need to be bold in that conversation you definitely need to be educated, but you have to be able to read how – like you're, the difference between talking to a not an anti-hunter and then talking to a politician who's trying to figure out the best way to handle things for his country. How do you handle that? How do you have that conversation? How bold do you need to be? How do you need to kind of hold back just a little bit and create rapport because you know this relationship could be long term? Like I'd Mm -hmm. rather, I'd much rather, like I said in the beginning, I'd much rather find one common piece of ground that we can build relationship upon so that later we can come back together and because of the trust that we built, we can then have harder conversations. Yes, you're right. A hundred percent. So I'm, I, I think that it's important to kind of, before we end, I, I want to highlight what you've said. I, I want to make sure that people know that women's voices are important. Men's voices are important. Utilize those voices in the way that they can be used. Utilize them in a way that it's going to benefit our community. And if you have the ability to take a stand, to show your passion, to have that conversation, and you have the knowledge to do it, then do it. Be prepared for it, but do it. If you don't, give a couple of examples of people that you that have mentored you or that you know have more knowledge and say, hey, this is a huge passion of mine, but I am not as learned on it that I should have that conversation. But so-and-so and and -and so-and-so would be great to talk to you. Let's lift each other up and be able to push forward the agenda that we need to push in the best way possible. And if you know that you're going to have a discussion, whether it's live television or an article or whatever, seek help. Yeah. I am so willing, anybody that contacts me and says, hey, this is what's going on. I need Mm -hmm. some help here. I'm like, okay, here's your resources. Here's how you should handle this. This is my experience with that. Call me up. I don't care. I'd love to try to help you, help arm you the best way possible Mm -hmm. because ultimately you're relevant right now. Your story is relevant right now. They want that, that, that discussion. Don't back down from it. If you, if you feel comfortable taking it on, but be prepared, be Mm -hmm. prepared. 
That's the that's biggest the thing. Matter. Just be prepared. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Seek out help and be prepared. And and I I just want to say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to jump into something that you could be great at. Uh, mm-hmm. Don't jump into it without preparing and asking for help and doing the research that you need to do. But we need more people out there doing it well. So um, yep. I hope that people take that today to heart. And I hope that they hear your heart in this because it is huge. <laughs> it is Your heart is huge for this. And it's not just for me and you. It's for our families. It's for the next generations to come. It's for our world. And hopefully – People will hear that when they when they listen in. So that's right. Let's encourage each other. Let's stand together because mm-hmm. divisiveness only destroys us. Agreed. 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 Olivia, thank you. How can people, if they are looking to get in contact with you, or if they want to read up on a couple of things that you've written, how can they find you? So you can find me through. Um, I work world of hunting adventure, um, Mm -hmm. is my company. Um, find me on the social media platform, send me private messages. Um, for the most part, I am, you know, around and able to access my accounts and happy to help in any possible way. Um, so yeah, feel free to just send me a message through social media or, or through uh, world of hunting adventure. I'm happy to help. We can do that. Thank you, Olivia. I appreciate it. You're welcome, Amy. Thank you for having me today.